Now, the last mechanism that uh, ha had been going on in Iran, and, and, and in many ways the dynamics are still present today, is what I, I call, uh, barring from um, Giovanni Arrighi, uh, uh, my, my advisor back, back when I was a grad student, anti-systemic developmental drives. So this is a small, short quote from then Prime Minister Mir Hossein uh in 1989, right before he left the Prime Ministership, and he was speaking to the Parliament. Um, <clears throat> many of the Parliament hated him. Uh, certainly many in the government hated him. There was a lot of competition at the time in 89. And, and he said this very interesting quote, because it's after 10 years of war, 10 years after the Iranian Revolution, and he said that for 10 years this nation has lived for God, and, but the world is blind to our achievements. I mean, he's bragging. Uh, he says, but he says something interesting. Is, is this our problem or is this the world's problem? And he says, where, whether we want it or not, we are on strong competition with the outside world. The world asks about our scientific, economic, and cultural progress. And they gauge our ideology on that basis. And he says that even if there was no competition with the rest of the world, with the kind of geopolitical order, it would still be our duty to make this country the most prosperous in the world. There's this idea that the revolutionary elite in Iran didn't care about development, didn't care about catching up with the West. They just wanted to have everybody go to uh, seminary. It's actually not the case. So there was a, a shared understanding among the uh, revolutionary elite that the revolution had to prove its mettle. Uh, in fact, it's, it's not a coincidence that all revolutionary elites come to this shocking realization soon after they win which is that you come with, you know, you're living in a geopolitical order that is hostile to you by nature of the revolution itself, and your options are two. Your option is to modernize or to perish. So I think uh, while there was a shared understanding uh, among the political elite in Iran, they all disagreed on how to get there. But what you started to see was a shift in the elite itself. This is a picture of the first cabinet of President Hashmi Rafsanjani, uh, in the early 1990s, and I just want to show, like, you know, here's him there. One of the, one of the, he had a hard time growing a beard. You know, he he was uh, always uh, maligned for that, both by his friends on the left and his friends in the in the uh, in the clerical establishment. Uh, and but most of his cabinet are wearing suits. They are not wearing the frock uh, of the ulama. They are wearing suits, tieless suits, but suits nonetheless. Uh, and this was, of course, an attempt to display a technocratic air to this cabinet. It was called the Cabinet of Experts. And the use of the politics of expertise took on, uh, took a hold in, in Iran, uh, even by the end of the war, but certainly afterwards. And that politics of expertise is very important for understanding um, Iranian politics today. Why? Because if you want to catch up with the West, you know that the world is hostile to you. Your elite and your intelligentsia have left. Uh, what do you do? You have to make a new class. You have to make, uh, as it was called in the Chinese case, you have to make a, uh, a, red, a, a red expert class. They should be experts, but they still have to be red. So that's what Iran tried to do. They tried to make a technical cadre class. Here is the uh, gates of uh, University of Tehran, the famous gates. Um, uh, this was built, of course, before the revolution. Uh, and this is the currency of the Islamic Republic, a note that's not worth so much anymore. Nevertheless, on the currency itself is a kind of an homage to the participation of students in the revolution, but also the idea that the university itself is this kind of, this kind of prestigious object that the state, you know, the state should be linked to. And this had major effects, okay? This is the growth of uh, public and private universities in Iran from before the revolution to basically about five, three years ago. The brown line is private universities. The orange line is public universities. But together, you can see a huge explosion in higher education built all over the country in, in provincial towns where, you know, if I'm a patriarchal father in a smaller town, I don't want my daughter going to Tehran. That's the big evil city. Trust me, that's the way they think. It's an evil city. It's like the way someone in north of France thinks of Paris. You know, it's evil, it's dirty, it's full of thieves and liars. 
So I'm not going to send my daughter to Tehran. But a university opens up, you know, in a 25-minute drive from me. Well, yeah, I can, she, can, she can go there. So it actually provided this route of access to higher education for a lot of individuals in Iran, including women. And you can't see this graph too well, but this is the percentage of the population of kind of university age who completed higher education. Uh, the orange is 1970s, and the brown is 2010, and Iran is the third highest jump. In Iran, you can see there's a massive jump. Before the revolution, almost nobody had a tertiary education. The idea that there were all these university, university graduates in the revolution, that was all of them, basically. Right? And now, uh, of course, this has actually been go going up since then, since then. This may or may not be a good thing, as I'm going to get into, but this is certainly an effect. And this led to an inversion of the status order once again. Here is the uh, educational attainment of the members of the Iranian parliament. Uh, in 1980, the first parliament of the Islamic Republic, uh, very few people had anything above a diploma. Uh, you had you had you know you had real provincial. Uh, it was a provincial revolution. People came from the provinces. Rafsanjan, Hashmi Rafsanjan is a good example, who ended up uh, in uh, in the state in the state elite. So you know here's an example, and and you can see by you know, basically by the end of the 90s, early 2000s, there's an inversion. You have to have college degree, master's degree, and by the time by eventually they passed the laws, and you have to have a master's degree. To run for parliament, right? Yeah, yeah. What crazy, what crazy revolution is this? That you require a master's degree of your revolutionary politicians, master's degree in anything, <laughs> but a master's degree nonetheless, to to run for office uh, in Iran in the parliament. So the question is, who's changing who? You know, society is is changing, and the elite are changing also. And this is an example of kind of diaspora activism, <laughs> diaspora nationalism. Anyway, this is the cabinet, the first cabinet of Hassan Rouhani. And note again, uh, a cleric surrounded by tireless suits, but somebody uh, added all the universities that these individuals went to, maybe truthfully or not, but it doesn't matter, really. It's that somebody was like so proud of this cabinet that they attached all of the universities in the West that these cabinet members went to. Okay, so these are uh, three different mechanisms I have in the book. Different chapters of the book have different wealth organizations and the kind of politics of this process and the unintended consequences that come from it. Now, uh, because when you talk about Iran and say anything went right, you get attacked. Like the water is drinkable, you get attacked. So let's talk about the downsides. So let's, if you wanted the blood and guts, let's get to the blood and guts. You know, what happens when society goes through a transformation like this? in basically a generation and a half. Uh, you get the commodification of everything. The, your, you know, your credentials uh, matter as much as what they can get you. Uh, your, your revolutionary commitments stop mattering in many ways. Um, and uh, the kind of networks that you could rely on for you know, nepotism or other things, they, they in many ways they start to disappear when you move to the big cities. So what happens in these, in, these, in, the, in these types of rapid transformations? You get you know, what sociologists would call new forms of status distinction. I need to you know, both think of myself as different than others and also show other people that I'm different, that I'm better, that I'm moving up. Tell my, what am I going to tell my parents back in the home? That I'm doing well. I need to show things. And this produces uh, a lot of the, you know, the kind of goings on in Iran that we outside tend to report on at face value without tr taking a look at the transformations that have produced them. And here's an example. Intellectuals in Iran. Iranian newspapers, if you go to an Iranian newspaper stand, eh, there's 10 to 15 newspapers available. Political spectrum is kind of business press. You get the left-leaning press. You get the crazy right-wing press. You get a lot, of, a lot of newspapers on wrestling and soccer, of course. And you get you know, these, these kind of newspapers that every day there's a huge section in the newspaper devoted to philosophy. Hegel, Kant, uh, and then crazy French sexy theory, like you know, Foucault. Foucault's long done in Iran. They want the hippest stuff. They want new stuff. All right? And people want to know that you know that they know that they're reading this stuff. And I, I mean, I did an interview with Michael Burroway, 
uh, Berkeley sociologist. I did it in English. He visited Iran when I was there uh, a few years uh, back. So I interviewed him, and I interviewed him not about Iran, but about something else. I put it up on my blog. Six months later, I was standing at a newspaper kiosk. Somebody had translated that whole interview I did with Burroway, and then asked me, I'm a, why is this interesting? But yet it is. I mean, it's interesting. So this guy's very famous, you know. This is an important, it's an important newspaper, Shag newspaper. And it's like this every day in, the, uh, in these newspapers. The, the consumption of ideas, the production of ideas, the use of, of concepts and intellectuals, it's part of this process, you know. And, we, and the Iranians love to say that's just because we're all geniuses. We're all intellectuals. But it's not. I mean, it's, it's something has, something has, uh, has contributed to this. It's not just um, intellectuals. It's health care. This is like a common ad in Iran for nose jobs. <laughs> All right, here's the, here's the male one. This guy clearly, he just wants his nose off. He doesn't, there's not much aesthetic <laughs> distinction here. And this is, you see, here's the, here's the female one. This is before and after and before and after. Now, uh, this is an interesting phenomenon that, you know, I mean, there's lots of ink spilled on rhinoplasty in Iran, but but what it really means to me is that it's the kind of conspicuous consumption of health care that trickles down from the top. You know, like the Iranians didn't invent the nose job. Uh, it, it started at the very high, and then it kind of there was this consumption all the way down. And of course, nose jobs in Iran are uh, plentiful and cheap, and plentiful and cheap. Uh, and it's not just the impact of the diaspora, that, that, that we all in, in LA have great noses. It's not that. Uh, why would anybody, uh, you know, in a, in a small town in Iran care about that. Of course, as you, I mean, as some of you may have known that men and women in Iran, when they get a nose job, they leave the bandage on way longer than the doctor says is required. <laughs> Why would you do that? Why would you leave a bandage on your nose weeks, weeks and weeks and weeks? You want people to know that you had it done, okay? So this is not about just you. It's about you in relationship to this changing society. All right, so all that's in the book. The nose jobs are in the book. <laughs> they are in the book, OK? Now, and that was the end of the talk up until December 2017. <laughs> Let me read uh, just a little bit of the book to show, as usual, that I took, I'm taking credit for predicting something uh, in the end of the book. So in the end of the book, I uh, used a couple concepts from Giovanni Arrighi, who was comparing different types of developmental states in the 20th century and the contradictions of two different paths. He talked first about pro-systemic developmental states by authoritarian middle-income countries. So, you know, and we can think of the Pahlavi monarchy as one of these kind of pro-systemic development states, being that it basically was, you know, it was trying to catch up with an order that it really wasn't challenging, a geopolitical order. And, you know, Origi writes, and here's a quote from, I mean, I'm reading my book, that, you know, these types of countries pursued industrialization by inviting in large capitalist corporations from wealthy states, building up a sizable formal working and managerial class to employ in these domestic enterprises and securing revenue streams through international trade. In a manner, these states were able to carve out a share of economic resources from the world economy, the famous economic booms of Iran and other middle-income states in the 1970s. Such states tended to distribute these resources among both elites and the small strata of technical and industrial workers who were being gradually empowered through the processes of urbanization and proletarianization that were bound up in the developmental push. The majority of the population, however, was largely excluded from this <laughs> state-led process of economic and social development. Uh, this led to various attempts to contain the rising social power of a large middle and working classes in these countries such as Iran in the 1960s and 70s, in the form of military dictatorships or other coercive political structures. So it's not a coincidence, by the way, that Arrighi argued that waves of parliamentary democratizations occurred across southern Europe and Latin America in the 1970s and 80s, uh, which became later known as the third wave of democratization. This largely took place uh, among pro-systemic developmental states. And I would actually include the Iranian Revolution as part of this wave in 1979. Anti-systemic developmental states, conversely, pursued a different internal strategy. And this is where I would put the Islamic Republic of Iran. In instead of creating exclusionary social welfare compacts 
and securing protection for the main geopolitical powers in the world economy. Authoritarian states in places like the USSR and Eastern Europe created highly inclusive social welfare systems as part of their developmental strategy. This provided a social underpinning to these regimes that for a period generated internal legitimacy and allowed for the pursuit of costlier internal drives for industrialization and modernization outside the ambit of large capitalist enterprises and hegemonic powers in the world. Yet this path also contained contradictions. As the social power of previously weak groups, workers and peasants under the old regime, under the Pathway regime, for example, became more nearly equalized with the livelihoods of upper strata, it became increasingly difficult to portray the authoritarian rule of state elites as a means to the protection of society. Instead, state elites came to be perceived more and more as using authoritarian means to protect their own power and privilege. So to paraphrase uh, Chuck Tilly, this form of post-revolutionary social welfare compact over time became to resemble a rather non-revolutionary protection racket. So while the Islamic Republic never engaged in social engineering on the scale of Stalinist era Soviet Union or Eastern Europe, the process that, is, the process that has occurred uh, in Iran over the past three decades is similar. Uh, and indeed, popular descriptions of the political elite in the Islamic Republic today use terms such as mafia that can be heard throughout the post-Soviet sphere. And the mafia is a kind of a folk term. It's not an analytically useful term, I think, for understanding the state. But it's a folk term that we should take it seriously when it's, you see it pop up in lots of different countries. And now I'm going to just bring you quickly to, uh, to December, January. This is the scale of the protests that occurred in Iran, the largest geographically since 1979. Uh, so in breadth, although maybe not in depth of participation, but in breadth of geography, uh, this is just over a week. Uh, you know, over 70 cities had some form of protest with demands ranging from economic grievances to say, or throw the bum style out slogans against uh, all sides of the political spectrum in Iran. So, now again, I'm a sociologist, so I want to look at the structural underpinnings uh, of what might have produced not just the protests themselves, you can't say a structure produced an outcome, but you can say, you know, what, how, what, how can we situate the grievances of these protests, which looked very different than the 2009 protests that I, I witnessed. So what happened to all those educated people? Those over, I mean, um, I would argue that they're now being overeducated. There's a process in Iran which economists would call over-credentialization. This is the unemployment rate uh, of university graduates in Iran. It's not just because uh, um, youth unemployment is not just this thing that hovers in the Middle East, it just exists because the Middle East is backwards. No, it's, youth unemployment in Iran is a product of credentialization, that people get credentials and refuse to work in lower strata occupations. And they, they engage in a process which sociologists call kind of weighthood, where they just kind of wait for a civil service job to open up. So they can get that sweet, sweet Social Security Organization uh, pension uh, and, and, and access to the social policy, right? So youth unemployment in Iran is not is actually bifurcated. You have uh, sort of lesser educated individuals in the labor market for them, and then the boundary has shifted quite rapidly. The higher ed educated individuals and the inability of the economy to absorb absorb uh, their kind of upwardly mobile desires and the way that they have to present themselves to others as being moving up. So on one hand, you have over-credentialization uh, of, of society. And on the other hand, you have um, a rising uh, contention from below among you know, skilled and non-skilled workers in a variety of sectors. So here are two uh, figures of labor unrest in Iran put together from a database that one of my students, Zepp Kalb, has been building. Uh, and this is a, an index of unrest in Iran among laborers, including teachers, pensioners, um, you know, it's not just the classic factory workers, although we have petrochemical, petrochemical workers, many, many, many. So this is an index, not an absolute counted index. So like 100 in 2012. By 2015, it's up to 400. There's a huge teacher's strike in 2015. Almost none of this is reported in Western journalism because they're focusing on middle classes, on, you know, kind of lipstick jihad type stuff. But in Iran, there was massive contentious politics from the breakdown of 
public sector uh, employment, the privatization uh, of, of, of large sectors of the economy, and the subcontracting out uh, of, of, of labor contracts. Um, uh, so, and of course, the uh, stagnation in, in wages. And this is the share of that unrest that uh, was outside of Tehran. So this is about 60% in 2012, and it kept rising every year. Every year, more and more and more of these protests were happening outside of Iran. If you take a look at the cities that had a protest in, 2000, in December, January, every one of those cities has, has had a history of labor protests over the last four or five years. Not saying that the same people participated in both, but I am saying that that uh, protests and contentious politics in Iran uh, has been going on and has been building uh, for years. And in fact, you know, just to say, what are we doing here about this? You know, we we're, we are building a, a social protest project at UCLA, where we're going to actually build a, a nationwide database of social unrest going back to the revolution, so we can re analyze the role of protests from below uh, in pushing uh, demands uh, onto state elites. These people have, have been always left, often left out of the story of post-revolutionary Iran. So we want to empirically document and show and link these processes to changes in the economic structure and changes in the political dynamics. I'm not expecting you to read this. I'm just showing you this is another project we're doing, on, we're doing here. You know, what, what have the highly competitive political elite in Iran been yelling at each other for the last five years? They've been accusing each other of corruption. You can't open up a newspaper in Iran without seeing Hegel or an accusation of corruption. <laughs> so if you're, if you're living in Iran the last few years and, and everyone at the top is accusing everyone else of corruption, well, you're going to think the state is corrupt. And you're probably right, but you're certainly everyone is going to be talking about it. And one of the main... Uh, elements of, uh, of grievances in the protests in 2017-18 was corruption, state corruption. This is a project that we've expanded here at UCLA, the Commanding Heights project. And what we're doing is we're mapping out the networks of the new business elites in Iran, those who uh, uh, you know, you know, uh, absorbed the former public sector uh, of the Islamic Republic, and we're looking at you know, who are the new business elites in Iran, what are their revolutionary backgrounds, and also looking at the changes in economic ownership of the commanding heights of the economy over time. Now, you know, in, in both the domestic press in Iran, as well as the Western coverage of it, we hear a lot about military ownership of the economy. This is a correct but um, not complete uh, uh, picture of the Iranian commanding heights. In fact, and that's, that's what really this shows, is that actually a host of semi-public, parastatal, uh, or other types of you know, non-public but non-private uh, institutions that have owned, absorbed, and, and expanded huge chunks of, of the Iranian economy across all sectors. Uh, and so instead of just looking for the bad guys, like looking for the military, which is what you know, maybe the Treasury Department does in, in Washington, we decided to look at the entire structure of the top economy and measure the changes in ownership over time. So, for example, the Social Security Organization, that organization I mentioned, it has a huge investment fund. Huge. It owns arguably, I'm not, I mean, it's hard to put a number, but a large chunk of the Iranian economy because the government owed it arrears over some years to just start giving it companies, giving it companies. So this pension fund is engaging in you know, a very uh, a way of common but interesting form of, of, of capitalist development in Iran. Almost never mentioned in Western press until now. So it's not just the military. It's actually a host of actors who are now in the economy. And so we're going to try to understand this. Um, but since it's so opaque, and, it, and, it, and of course the discourse around it is that it, it's all corrupt, it's all opaque, it's, it's no, it's no uh, coincidence that many grievances are driven by this process. And lastly, again, this is too small to say, but I'll, I'll show you what we're doing here. Uh, we want to map uh, the changing state society linkages in, in Iran. So, you know, I had a hunch in my book that the myth, there was this myth that the Islamic Republic was linked to the poorest part of society, and because that was the case, those people were bought off through oil rents, through whatever, and then everybody else was autonomous, intellectual, Western-friendly, and they were the site of change. 
that totally is wrong. That whole story is wrong. Uh, one of the things we've been doing is uh, in Iran, social survey prod project. We ran a large social survey in Iran in 2016. This is not a survey of political opinion, but a survey of social relations and political behavior. They're very different. And for example, we asked questions about, does anybody in your household get aid or income or insurance from a large list of organizations? And what we show in the survey is that revolutionary organizations, this is the one that I wrote a chapter in the book about, the Imam Khomeini Relief Committee, basically, has, this is by income group, by income group here, sorry it's so small, but basically, even in the poorest stratum of Iranian society, about 15% of households are linked to this revolutionary welfare organization that is supposed to often characterized as kind of driving Iranian politics from below or telling people how to vote. Instead, you know, the biggest organization here is this blue one, the Social Security Organization. And even among poorer households, there's a lot of households who are linked. Uh, but as you, of course, you move up the income ladder, uh, you know, about half of households are, are linked to this. So, you know, as, as I get mentioned in the book and tried to justify, but now we know even better through the survey, the welfare system in Iran benefits the middle classes most, than, better than the poorest, which is totally normal. This is what happens in every middle-income country, actually. That you get, you get uh, linkage to the state among the middle and upper strata. So one of the things we're doing in the survey project is to kind of look at class mobility over generations. If you started at the bottom, if I mean, if your father was, in a, was a peasant, what, how likely is it you're going to be high uh, versus somebody whose father was uh, educated? Are you going to move down or up? So we're going to be looking at this before and after the revolution, up until today. And the other thing we can do with surveys like this is we can look at the class and demographic characteristics of people's political behavior. <coughs> so I can give an example. Well, I have a different chart for later. But let me give an example. So uh, you know, I often was reading in the, in the scholarship and among journalists that individuals who, get, you know, link, uh, who are linked up to the revolutionary side of the state they're going to vote for conservatives because that's how politics works in Iran. And that's how the conservatives keep delivering the vote, 30, 40 percent for them in these elections. And I never really saw any evidence for this that was systematic. So we, 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 looked, we checked in the, in, the, in the survey. We asked, you know, who did you vote for in 2013? Who did you vote for in 2016? It's difficult to get those questions, but we, we tried. And we didn't find any difference based on whether someone was, had access to, uh, you know, low-income aid organization or a kind of middle-class welfare organization, where, how they voted in the presidential elections. So I, I have a graph on that later I can show you. But. And lastly, uh, you know, again, as a sociologist, it's not just about the politics. It's how, do, how does this uh, co competitive political elite articulate in society? And one of the things we found from this survey is that very few people identify with a faction, with these competing factions from above. They identify with individuals, maybe. You know, they identify with individual politicians, and they maybe vote for them. But they don't see themselves uh, you know, as, I am this party. I am this association. So about 10% of our survey respondents said that they thought I was, they were close to any individual faction, um, which is common to the Middle East. It's not, oh, this is not unique to Iran. And here uh, is a figure which I'm really glad we were able to produce, which I've never seen anybody been able to do in Iran before, which is you ask people how they voted in 2013, you ask how they voted in 2016, and you see whether people switch their votes from one faction to another. And there's a lot of factional switching in Iran. This is like, you know, kind of grouped together. And this is a report we just put out in 2018 uh, with my colleague and I. We put together the survey. Okay, so let me just end here by saying that. Uh oh, that didn't work out. That, you know, one of the, here's here's the graph I'm talking about. So these are three different types of social policy linkages to the state, and these are the different candidates for um, election in 2013. Here's Rouhani at the bottom, and there's no really no difference whether they're a poor individual uh, or a middle class individual linked to these organizations that you can see in the vote. So. I think, well, I mean, you know, one of the things that we really need to do is we need to unpack all the assumptions that we built up in scholarship on Iran for the last 35 years. For example, the idea that the state uh, has a loyal base in the rural and poor strata. I think if the protest showed us anything, it's that this long canard of explaining Iranian politics by saying that the revolution has its base in the poor because they're not educated, they're religious, 
and uh, you know they don't know what's best for them. Uh, this, this doesn't explain anything. It certainly doesn't explain the protests. Uh, and maybe we need to go back and look at what we thought was going on in Iran in the 1990s and 2000s uh, that, that, that made us think this. It might be more in our heads than in reality. Uh, the other is that, you know, that the elite of the Islamic Republic is some kind of traditional hangover from Pahlavi society. There's a bunch of clerics and a bunch of merchants. As opposed to this actually, you know, a, a political establishment that's gone through major transformations uh, since 1979. Same characters, the same cast of characters, they've gone through major transformations. They talk differently, they act differently, they do politics uh, differently. And uh, we have Mirzad Borojadi here who has, a, has put out the, uh, the holy book of the Iranian political elite, which is uh, soon out, uh, about a thousand pages uh, of work on, you know, sort of biographies uh, of the political elite in Iran after 79. So that actually can be a source base for looking at, you know, mapping out the elite in new ways. All right. For the Q&A, I want to say, you know, a couple of things, and I'll, I'll hand it over to Afshin. Uh, to say what's going to happen next in Iran is very difficult because there's a lot of balls in the air. So what's been going on since the nuclear deal? What was the nuclear deal? Did, he, did Rouhani and the kind of, you know, liberal side of the political establishment Iran really think that European capital is going to save the Islamic Republic? No. I mean, they're not stupid. They're not stupid. It's not just that FDI is going to come in and save everything. They might say that, but what was really going on was the politics of the deal. The politics of the deal was to lock in the other side of the political establishment and limit their ability to maneuver because it would, it would threaten uh, so many of the arrangements that had been, you know, been in place, been made in place since the deal. So, you know, kind of sweet deals with European capital, you know, buying off some part of the political elite to keep them happy. And this idea was to lock them in. Uh, this questionably, arguably, may have already backfired, but it could backfire even more. Um, and the promises that the Rouhani government had made was that, you know, you're going to see, I mean, you, you think that Ahmadinejad promised things. Rouhani really promised things. Promised that, you know, the deal was going to manifest itself in a better life for everybody in a matter of years. I mean, how long would it take for foreign capital FDI to really transform an economy? Five, ten years at least. So they overpromised, and, you know, any serious development economists would tell you that FDI alone, just because European capital starts flowing into the economy or Russian or Chinese capital, that's not going to save Iran. It's not going to turn Iran into South Korea. So they, they know this. They, they don't admit it, but they know this. But you know, this, is a, this is a very um, tenuous uh, uh, gambit. The geopolitics of the Levant are uh, a, a, a known unknown. We, you know, uh, people think that Iran is some kind of mastermind and spycraft, that they, they totally know what's going on everywhere and they, they have it all under control. This is, a, this is, I think, us projecting onto them for our own failures, you know, for kind of our own overstretch, U.S. overstretch in the region. And now that U.S. is basically leaving in, in one way or another, albeit uh, with a lot of proxy interventions, you know, we love to say that the Iranians know what they're doing. But there's a high possibility of overstretch by the Iranians uh, maybe in southern Lebanon, maybe somewhere else, which ends up in a shooting war that they symbolically lose or have to retreat. You know? And they can say whatever they want, but the world all of a sudden perceives them as losers. And <laughs> you don't want to be in a situation in a revolutionary state where you're seeing that. So this could trigger some type of dynamic inside the country I can't predict. The lumping and splitting among the political elite will not end, and the protests will only push this forward. So lumping and splitting with the political establishment usually involves some segment trying to ride the tiger of popular mobilization. That's what the book is basically about. Uh, and you know, this may, just like what some people claim happened in, in late 2017, this may provoke new upsurges that are out of control of the political elite. These upsurges may not go the way that we want. Okay, the Trump effect, uh, which is already happening in Iran, but you know, let's say Trump does something. You know, which he had, well, probably he will do, something that we cannot predict vis-a-vis uh, -vis Iran. This could set the stage for a, re a renewed social base, both in the middle uh, and in the lower stratum of society, uh, to support uh, a renewed right-wing authoritarianism in Iran. It could happen. I mean, I mean, I can see it very easily happening over the next five years, especially because 
uh, the Iranian government right now wants nothing to do with Trump. They don't want to talk to them at all. I don't blame them. But nevertheless, this is the possibility. And well, you know, since this is a kind of this is a forum for leftists and socialists to talk about the world, the options for a socialist or social democratic left uh, in Iran is not just that you can have protests and you get a political transition or a revolution. You know, there has to be a coalition, there has to be politics, there has to be articulation between organizations and individuals. This idea that it's just going to be done on Twitter or on Telegram is a mirage, is a mirage. So, you know, Ashley can also talk about this, but, but the prospects of this are quite limited for a kind of coherent organization to grow uh, these forces. More likely, just to be honest, as an, as an analyst, more likely is a continuation of these various elite pacts. And if social uprisings and upsurges do not, you know, force demands onto these elite packs, we're going to see a continuation of the status quo. That's my read uh, of the situation, okay? All right, and that's it.